Are we ready? Go ahead, Melissa. Go ahead, start. Okay. All right, hello everybody and welcome. Um, our speaker is so popular that we have another Zoom room going with already oh 40 people in there. We're redirecting them. And so people are gonna be popping in and I apologize if you hear that going on in the background. Um, welcome everybody to Who Killed Malcolm X? How a Netflix documentary led to a historic um, exoneration, a virtual talk by guest speaker, Abdur Rahman Mohammed. This event is the 14th hosted by the Colonial, the Post-Colonial, and the Decolonial Research Cluster, which is co-organized by myself, Melissa Free, Assistant Professor of English, and Isaac Jocelyn, Assistant Professor of French at Arizona State University. It is sponsored by the Institute for Humanities Research, whom we want to thank for the support they have lent us over the years. This particular event is also supported by ASU's Department of English and ASU's African and African American Faculty and Staff Association. I also want to give special thanks to Mina La Havardi, Kenja Hassan, Brandon Grost, and Kristen LaRue Sandler for extraordinary technical and or communication support. Above all, I want to thank Keith Miller, professor of English, who is too modest to allow me to introduce him. So Google his faculty profile and is growing impatient as of course he wants our speaker to have the maximum amount of time possible. I will now turn it over to Keith Miller who will introduce our speaker and explain the format. Thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And Today, ASU has a great honor and privilege to hear from our, one of the great researchers of our time. This man, Mr. Abdul Rahman Muhammad, spent years and years as an unpaid freelance researcher on a lonely quest for justice, for justice in the case of the assassination of Malcolm X. He spent countless hours researching, and he finally got Netflix to pay attention and to do a documentary. And the documentary proved so successful that it spurred the Manhattan prosecutor to reopen the case. In November 2021, the Manhattan prosecutor exonerated two men who had been wrongfully imprisoned for murdering Malcolm X. So we want to welcome uh, Mr. Abdur Rahman Mohammed, and I want to acknowledge Kinja Hassan, who's right over here. Uh, who's one of our sponsors, and uh, welcome to everybody. It's my honor to give you Mr. Abdur Rahman Muhammad. He will, he will speak about 20 minutes, he will speak about 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes, then we'll have Q&A. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, it's my pleasure and extreme honor to be with you and the community there at uh, ASU. Um, it, is, it is always a great opportunity to uh, share with the next generation of scholars and our very, very um, bright students who we have entrusted so much hope for the future. And uh, I thank you once again uh, for this invitation. Uh, I'd like to talk on a topic tonight, how a Netflix documentary led to a historic exoneration in the assassination of Malcolm X. The documentary, of course, is called Who Killed Malcolm X? And it's still trending on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, please go and watch it. Uh, I think you'll find it very engaging and informative. Um, but it's been a long journey. And before we get to the Netflix documentary, we're gonna to have to go back in time, uh, back to the early 60s, because um, we have to recreate the era and the context uh, by which um, wherein Malcolm X was brutally gunned down in the Autobahn ballroom on February 21st, 1965. Now, in today's time, uh, we tend to laud and praise Malcolm X in the same way, the very same way, in fact, that we praise Dr. Martin Luther King, right? 
So when we speak of uh, the civil rights era, we talk about Malcolm and Martin, right? And we always kind of conjoin the two. They enjoy an equal stature and status and preeminence in the history of our struggle in America, the history of the black freedom struggle. Today, we look at them as being two equals, two giants on an equal platform. However, that was not the case in the early 1960s. Um, in fact, uh, Malcolm X was something of a reviled figure for most of America, both black and white. It, you know, it's, you know, to, in today's um, reading of the history, we think that Malcolm was uh, accorded uh, the honor and the acclaim uh, that he enjoys today. Today, he is on a U.S. stamp, an honor that was bestowed upon him in 1999. Uh, today, one could even argue that his acclaim has, has risen uh, a little above my, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, just recently, last couple of years, so much cultural production has been generated around the personality of Malcolm X. You've had a uh, series called The Godfather of Harlem. Um, you've had a, uh, of course, our internationally acclaimed and historic documentary, docuseries Who Killed Malcolm X. Uh, another series, One Night in Miami. We've had Blood Brothers, which tells the story of uh, Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay at that time, the very famous, world famous boxer and his relationship with Malcolm X. Um, and it goes on and on and on. There has been a uh, new biography that came out last year that went on to win the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize by the legendary Dean of Black journalist Les Payne, who sadly uh, passed away um, just recently, called The Dead Our Rising, a very informative book that gives us a lot of new information. And on and on and on, a book about Malcolm's mother, The Life of Louise Norton Little by Brenda Russell and his sister Hilda. Uh, and so much has been done about Malcolm in, in the last couple of years. And so it's, it could be very easy for our younger generation to uh, believe that he enjoyed that type of acclaim and respect even in his own era, but that was not the case at all. Uh, and his death was not treated the same way the death of uh, Martin Luther King was, treat, uh, was treated, um, you know, in 1968, three years later. Uh, when Malcolm was, um, was assassinated, it was just seen as a case of, uh, you could say, black on black crime, right? Uh, it was just, it, it, it was the case of um, a man who by this time had fallen, uh, you know, out of the public spotlight. He had been in Africa for uh, half of the last year that he was out of the nation of Islam. He, was, he wasn't out of the nation of Islam a complete year, right? It, just a couple of weeks short of a, of a year um, that he was out of the nation. And half of that time, he was in Africa. He was complaining that he couldn't get any press attention. The only time he could get you know, any notice in the press is when he uttered some type of sensational or bombastic statement, right? Something, uh, you know, headline grabbing. Uh, for example, uh, we need a mile mile in America. We need a mile mile in Mississippi. We need a mile mile, you know, in the South, you know, the mile mile being the revolutionary guerrilla army uh, that fought for anti-colonial anti system in Kenya uh, under Jomo Kenyatta, uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, vicious, um, brutal fighters, you know, um, and some called them terrorists, actually. So the only way he could get media attention, he had to say something like that. He was complaining. The press wasn't taking his death threats, the death threats against him seriously. 
Um, and so uh, he, had, he had fallen out. 1963, let's go back to 1963. And I, and I, and I mentioned 63 because this was the height of Malcolm's notoriety before his downfall in the nation, okay? July of 1963, the month before the March on Washington, which was, uh, of course, August 28th, 1963, a Newsweek magazine issued a special, um, a special issue, it was titled The Negro in America, and they did a survey of all black people in America, and they wanted black folk to rate the leadership of different leaders. In that survey, Martin Luther King was rated at 85, 88%. Just say 88%. Elijah Muhammad, on the other hand, who was the leader of the Nation of Islam, and we could say by extension, Malcolm X, who was his national spokesman, was only rated 15, 15%, okay? So what you're saying is only 15% of Black America at that time supported the Black Muslims, supported their uh, solution to the race problem, as, as it was called at that time, 15% uh, you know, you could say uh, endorse their very, very strange religion, a religion that taught that all white people were evil by birth, by race. They were born a devil, a race of devils. This is what Elijah Muhammad taught. And he taught a very pessimistic form of black nationalism, which said that um, it was impossible for black folk in America to become full and equal citizens in America. And therefore, he presented a, what he called a divine solution to the race problem, total separation of the black and the white, that black people should accept him as God's final prophet and messenger to black people in America, that he would uh, bestow on them heaven on earth, right here on this earth, if they would follow him and separate from the white man. Now, he never made it clear where they were going to separate to. And, you know, you can see why only 15% of Black people followed this uh, philosophy, or at least, you know, supported Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm. And, and that's because, you know, most Black people in America, from very early on, you know, made this stand and said, this is our country and we're not going anywhere, right? You can go as far back as uh, 1827 with the founding of Freedom Journal in New York uh, under the editorship of uh, John Russwarm, who's considered one of, if not the first black college graduate in America and Samuel Cornish, they founded this paper uh, uh, right uh, after the abolition of slavery in the state of New York, okay? That was 1827. However, they were unfortunate enough to take the editorial line that Black folks should consider migrating back to Africa. In fact, John Russwarm, one of the editors, he actually died in Africa, okay? Um, needless to say, <laughs> The paper folded after only two years. Another owner came in, bought it, tried to revive it. Couldn't, didn't go anywhere. Why? Because by the beginning of the 19th century, Black people had been in this country, you know, several generations. They spoke English. They were Americans. And they were just as American as anyone else and their investment in the building of America was you know, as much, if not more, than any other people in America. So that when Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm appeared uh, to say that there's no hope for us here, we have to separate, most Black people rejected that. And they also rejected the message of hate, hatred of the white man. Okay, we can have our 
we have our grievances with white people, but you know, black folk being Christians for the most part, they weren't going to, you know, uh, subscribe to any notions of racism and, you know, hatred of someone just because of their race. And that was just too much hate for black folk, right? We're, you know, very, very loving people, very forgiving people. So this was, uh, you know, 1963, the most support the nation could get was 15%. And by the way, this was at a time when many books were written about the nation. Um, 61, we had a book, the first book, uh, was called The Black Muslims in America by C. Eric Lincoln. By 62, there was another one called Black Nationalism by E.U. Essien Odom, the Nigerian scholar who took Malcolm around Africa, uh, Nigeria, uh, you know, when he was in Nigeria. By 63, when the word is given by the Black journalist and friend of Malcolm, Louis Lomax, debated Malcolm on, on many occasions. Uh, the, you know, 1963, the Nation of Islam was still quite hot as a topic. Uh, they burst on the scene in 1959 uh, in the television show, the news program, The Hate That Hate Produced by a local New York uh, television journalist by the name of Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes fame. A lot of folks don't know that 60 Minutes um, was the um, sort of the, uh, the come up for Mike Wallace. It's the Nation of Islam that uh, made Mike Wallace a star, really. Him discovering through Louis Lomax, you know, his producer, uh, the Black Muslims. And this is when the country was first introduced to Malcolm X and this, uh, this huge, um, the never before seen black organization that taught that uh, they didn't want integration. They were anti-integration. Uh, they were pro-separation and definitely anti the white man. So I'm, I'm kind of painting a picture for you because, you know, in today's world, we talk about something trending, right? And the nation of Islam had a good period where it was really trending in the media and it was trending until it was not, okay? So by 1965, the public knows what the nation is now, right? Uh, they've read many articles and books and Malcolm was on television all the time. And so the nation had a, the, the country had a good idea of what the nation of Islam was about and they didn't like it, okay? And they didn't like it, uh, you know, Malcolm, of course, is going to fall out with the nation. And six by 60, uh, 64, March of 64, he's going to be out. And he's going to spend half of the next year in Africa. And so you're talking about an organization that was never, uh, uh, you know, a pre or accepted an organization that was seen as really kind of weird. Uh, the, the ideas were seen as kind of, uh, you know, uh, escapist, goofy, even somebody would say, you know, like, because, um, you know, where are you going to go with this ideology, right? And so it, 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 you know, it lost its luster. The, you know, the only time the Nation of Islam was really being discussed in the media at this time was it, it, the, the hatred that the country felt towards Muhammad Ali when he had accepted its teachings uh, and announced his membership in it uh, in February of, uh, of 1964, um, you know, when he became a heavyweight championship of the world. You know, that pretty much is what you heard. By the time Malcolm comes back from Africa, in a sense, the young people will understand this term, he had fallen off. He had fallen off. And yes, he did make the pilgrimage to Mecca, the holy city of Mecca, and he renounced all of these racist ideologies and uh, the dogma of the white devil. He renounced all of that, okay? But he was still seen as a radical figure uh, a, a, a complicated figure, and no one really understood, you know, where he was trying to go. He was preaching a form of black nationalism. 
He was talking about armed self-defense. And he was talking about bringing our case, Black folk in America before the UN to indict the United States government for its treatment of, of Black people, its brutal treatment of Black people and their denial of our human rights. He always rejected the term civil rights. Uh, he, he wouldn't call himself a civil rights leader. He was a human rights leader. Um, but uh, his luster, a lot of the luster, whatever luster you know, he had, had, had fallen off. And so people weren't following him like that. So the point that I'm beginning at is when he was assassinated, it was, just, it was not seen as the, the, like the assassination of Dr. King. Dr. King, when he was assassinated three years later, um, it was seen as a national tragedy. Dr. King was the moral voice of the movement. He was a Christian, and, and of course, this is a mostly Christian country. He taught love, he taught brotherhood, okay? He taught nonviolent, passive resistance. Malcolm was saying, you know, if the government can't defend our rights and protect us, we should take up arms under the Second Amendment and defend ourselves at, by any means necessary, okay? And that scared white people. That, that, mean, that scared white America. But Dr. King was more palatable, okay? He was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And so when he was cut down, he, although he had lost a lot of his luster at the end of his life as well, it was still seen as a national um, disaster, a calamity, a trauma. Uh, his funeral was broadcast on all of the national uh, media outlets. Uh, he was, you know, taken away to his final resting place in a horse-drawn case on. It, it was, you know, it, it was a, the, you know, let's put it like this, the nation mourned Dr. King in a way that it did not mourn Malcolm X. In the case of Malcolm X, in most quarters in America, it was like good riddance. Well, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You know he preached violence. You know he pre you know he was against white people. You know, you know he was a demagogue. And it's just it wasn't white people who said these kinds of things. The black middle class, the black educated elite, and many black leaders couldn't stand Malcolm. Third good marshal who went on to become the first black Supreme Court justice, he despised Malcolm. He called him in so many words, an articulate thug, okay? That's how they saw it. Uh, they're a good marshal who was one of the architects of the Brown versus Board of Education ruling uh, in 1954 Supreme Court that dismantled segregation in the public school system. Here's a third good marshal who like is the living example of what integration is supposed to be. Okay, and here's Malcolm and Elijah uh, preaching to black people that this was impossible, was never going to happen. It was it was antithetical, right, to everything Thurgood Marshall, Carl T. Rowan, Martin Luther King, Roy Wilkins, Andrew, you know, Andrew Young, all of these people. I'm thinking about Whitney Young, right? Adam Clayton Powell is antithetical to everything they stood for. So when Malcolm died, you know, the, you know, it was just seen as a tragic case of black on black. And, and most importantly of all, it was understood by the general public with, without much scrutiny that the black Muslims, his own people, they said, are the ones who took him out. I'll read you what Dr. King had to say about it. Dr. King gave a statement he said, well, I think that we have to agree that this appears to be the result of an internal conflict within the black nationalist movement. So I think the first thing that needs to be done for a conference of goodwill to take place between black nationalist leaders, I suggested a few days ago that the followers of the late Malcolm X and the followers of Elijah Muhammad 
should sit down at the peace table together, so to speak, and discuss this problem and try to reach some understanding. I don't think, and I'm sure, that nothing can be accomplished by violence. It only leads to new and more complex social problems. But I think that it is unfortunate for the Black nationalist movement. I think it is unfortunate for the health of our nation. That's Dr. King. So when the preeminent Black leader frames Malcolm's assassination as Black on Black crime, um, not much, you know, there's not much interest uh, in, you know, in his loss, really. And so three men were arrested. One man was arrested at the scene. He was actually shot in the leg. His name was Talmadge Haya. He was shot in the leg at the scene. Two other men were arrested. Muhammad Abdul Aziz and Thomas 15X Johnson. Uh, at that time, Muhammad was known as Norman 3X Butler. Today's Muhammad Abdul Aziz. And uh, Thomas 15X Johnson went on to be known as Khalil Islam. And those are the names that they were exonerated under. Uh, Norman 3X Butler was picked up five days later on the 26th. And Johnson, or Khalil Islam, he wasn't picked up till March 3rd. They weren't even at the ballroom. They were arrested at their homes and they both had alibis. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, I'll go into, you know, what some of the new evidence was that led to the exoneration. But the, case, the point is, there was, a, there, was a, there was a hue and cry to wrap this up, shut this down, make some arrests. Okay, there was a lot of fear of reprisals, um, double day press who had signed the contract with Alex Haley and Malcolm X for Malcolm's autobiography. They were so fearful of there going to be a war between Malcolm's followers and Elijah's followers. They were afraid for their booksellers and, and for their retail outlets that they sold the rights to the autobiography. They sold the book to Grove Press, who went on to publish it. And that is considered uh, the worst decision in publishing history. Okay? The book has gone on to become uh, an American classic. It's never gone out of print. It's one of the most powerful uh, works you will ever read. And if you really want to enhance your life this summer, if you haven't read that book, I encourage you all to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Malcolm was gunned down, as I said, at the Autobahn Ballroom, um, February 21st, 1965. Uh, and it was such a brutal and reckless, it was so brazen, such a brazen way that it sent a message loud and clear. Anyone searching for the assassins, if you saw what we did to Malcolm, then you know what we can do to you. If we can cut this man down in broad daylight, in front of 400 people, in front of his own wife, who was pregnant at the time, with two twins and his four beautiful daughters, cut them down like that, and most of them get away. If it wasn't for the fact that one of them was shot in the leg, they would have all got away. If we can get, if we're so reckless and brazen to take this man out like this, okay, then it's easy for us to take care of you. It's none of your business, leave it alone. And you heard that over and over and over and over again in our series. Leave it alone. And I will tell you what uh, Louis Farrakhan said, 1993, 
right after the release of Spike Lee's movie, Malcolm X in 92, Louis uh, Farrakhan said, if we, meaning the nation of Islam, if we dealt with Malcolm like a nation deals with a traitor, what the hell business is it of yours? And of course, he's only echoing the sentiments that he wrote back in December of 1963, 64, pardon me, when he said a man such as Malcolm is worthy of death, okay? So there was not any type of, you know, um, um, there was no enthusiasm really to get to the bottom of what happened. Two days after his assassination, the mosque in Harlem where he taught, for over a decade was firebombed and gutted. So there was paranoia, there was fear. Um, the, the, no one knew, you know, if the government was involved, it, you know, so uh, it, it just had to just, you know, die down. So after this trial, things kind of died down and not much became of it. We're leading to the documentary, right? We're leading to the documentary. Not much became of it until around 1977, 78. And that is when the man shot at the scene, his name was Talmadge Hayer. Today, he's known as Mujahid Abdul Halim. Uh, and in fact, by 1977, 78, he was known by that name. Um, he filed a couple of affidavits where he revealed the identities of the four of his four accomplices in the assassination, uh, which he had never done before. If you go back to the trial that I mentioned, that was in uh, 1966. January to March 1966, and they were given life sentences in April of 1966. When it was, when it became clear to him that the two innocent men, Muhammad Abdul Aziz and Khalil Islam, were going to be convicted with him, he took the stand again and he admitted his guilt, he admitted his role in the assassination. He couldn't deny it. They caught him with a 45 clip in his pocket and he was caught at the scene, but he said these two men had nothing to do with it. They had nothing to do with it, but it wasn't enough. The jury didn't believe him, um, and they were all three convicted. 1977, 78, he's experiencing a spiritual crisis, and let me tell you what happened. 1975, a major change comes into the nation of Islam. That is the year that its leader, Elijah Muhammad, passes away, okay? The leadership was assumed by his son, Imam Wallace D. Muhammad, okay? He went on to be known as Warath Deen Muhammad. He brought the community into the fold of traditional Orthodox Islam. He essentially dismantled the nation of Islam. He, he broke it all the way down. Okay? He got rid of the FOI, the Food of Islam paramilitary wing. Uh, he got rid of this hierarchy. He said, we are not the nation anymore. We're not teaching this white devil stuff anymore. We're not teaching that the, the founder, W.D. Farad, is Allah in person anymore. We're not teaching these things anymore. Okay? And... Um, this created, oh, and this is very important, by the way. And he introduced the Islamic theology, the real Islamic theology, that taught in the belief of an afterlife and a reward and a punishment after death. This never existed in the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam never believed in a physical resurrection or life after death to the survival of the soul after you die. Remember, I, Elijah Muhammad taught that heaven and hell 
with two conditions of life. If you have money, friendship in all walks of life and fine homes, you're in heaven. If you're broke, out of doors, no friends, you're in hell. If you come and you follow me, I will plant you in heaven immediately. That's what he used to teach. But when Wallace came into power, he changed the teachings and he introduced the belief in a life after death, which is very severe for the sinners, very much like Christianity. It taught in a literal hell fire. Okay. And who is this hell reserved for? The worst of the sinners, the worst of the criminals. And there's no greater crime than the murder of a Muslim. Murder in general. But to murder a Muslim, the Quran says the curse of Allah, the curse of God, is on the head of those who kill a Muslim. And this sent terror into the heart of Talmud Hayer in prison. Okay? It sent terror into his heart because Malcolm was a Muslim. Also, this is very important for why Hayer signed this affidavit. When Wallace came in, he called in all of the top ministers and he had a, a minister's meeting. And he told those men, you all follow my father. You love my father, the honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, but today I'm going to tell you about the dishonorable Elijah Muhammad. That's right. He revealed all of the dirty laundry. Of, of his father, the corruption, the financial corruption, and the moral corruption of his father. And he pointed to all of the, those children that his father had sired with his secretaries out of wedlock. All of these illicit affairs that Malcolm had charged Elijah Muhammad with, right? That's the reason why he was killed, because he exposed Elijah Muhammad's private life. Talmadge Hayer was lied. He was lied to about these women and these babies. In fact, all of the assassins were. They were told, and it was published in the newspaper, listen to this, that these women were the children, not of Elijah Muhammad, that these were Malcolm's children. These were Malcolm's babies. And you know what else they did? You know what else they said? They said, well, you know, he used to be a pimp. Well, he never really was a pimp, by the way. He denied being a pimp, but he was a steerer. He steered the Johns to the madam, but he himself never pimped women. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. They said, well, you know, he used to be a pimp. These women from Massachusetts, they would, they would, these women, a couple of these women were from Massachusetts. He said, these women were Malcolm's former prostitutes. And now he's gotten them pregnant and he wants to throw his filth, his corruption on the holy name of our dear holy apostle, the honorable Elijah Muhammad. If that man doesn't deserve to die, who does? And this was the lie that Talmadge here was told. But when Wallace came into power, and he confirmed these realities that Malcolm was trying to expose to the community. And the scales fell off of Talmadge Hayer's eyes. And he realized what he had done. Oh, my God. I killed one of the greatest leaders that our community has ever produced. And I did it on a lie. And he had a complete nervous breakdown in prison, okay? And he was deathly afraid that he was going to burn in the hellfire for the, he called in the prison imam. And he said, I have to, you look, I have to make this situation right. I, yes, I will have to face my maker on the day of judgment for what I did, but I have to try to clear these two men. And he started writing these affidavits, one in 77, one in 78. And he gave them to William Kunstler. You saw the series. Kunstler took it to the courts. 
but the courts said there was no new evidence here. Even though Talmadge Hayer named the names of his co-conspirators, the kind of cars they drove, their professions, how they planned it, how they organized it, everything. Judge Harold Rothwax, a New York judge, said uh, this is not new evidence. And, and anyway, how can I, how can I uh, implicate men now, 12 years later, who were not implicated at the time? I'm not going to do that. Not only that, he ordered the courts, he orders the police department not to investigate the real assassins, okay? So I'm gonna move it along and then I'm gonna open it up for questions because we're going to milestones along the way. 1981, Mike Wallace did a documentary or a story on 60 Minutes. Guess what it was called? Who Killed Malcolm X? The <laughs> same thing as our documentary. And guess what? It covers much of the same terrain as our documentary did on Netflix. And that's why, by the way, that famed attorney, uh, Barry Sheck, who represented the Innocence Project, who represented Muhammad Abdulaziz and Khalil Islam in their November 18th, 2000, and 21 exoneration. That's the reason why he said this was an exoneration that was hiding in plain sight, hiding in plain sight. Just like those assassins in Newark were, and Patterson, New Jersey were hiding in plain sight, so was this exoneration. Mike Wallace did, does his 1981 story. He interviews, um, Hayer, he interviews Muhammad Abdulaziz, he interviews Khalil Islam, still nothing becomes of it. Fast forward a story along. If you do well, this is what this is what uh, you know, this is the trajectory to the Netflix series. Spike Lee. We have to talk about Spike Lee. Spike Lee releases this incredible biopic, Malcolm X, in 1992, that is based on Malcolm's autobiography, okay? What is most important for this discussion? If you go to the end of the movie, the assassination scene, which is on YouTube, you can, you can pull it up. Spike Lee, who did his own research, and it did many interviews, he reconstructs the scene of the assassination in the Autobahn Ballroom, February 21st, 1965, almost exactly as it happened. And uh, he, he, he reconstructed it according to Hayer's affidavits and not the theory presented at the trial that convicted these three men, which only involved three men. That was the government's case. They said the three men created a disturbance in the back. Then they, or at least some of the men created disturbance in the back. They ran to the front, fired the weapons, and then they ran out, and then one of Talmud was shot. No. The affidavit said, Talmud Hayer said that there were five men involved, five men. And, and this is one thing that I forgot to tell you as well. In 1966, at the trial, he did say that there were four other men involved, but he wouldn't give their names. He would not give their names. That's very important, okay? Mr. Mohammed, we, we have a lot of student questions, so. Okay, let I, me wrap I know up you, I know you're still going, but, but I hate to interrupt, but. Well, I got. To, I have. I have as much time as you want for any questions. Okay. So, yeah, I'm. No, I'm going to handle questions because I. But I want to get this out. I want the people yeah, to know no, this okay, stuff. Okay. I'm here for the questions. All right. Um, I've been working on this for decades, and I, I have a lot to say. So I'm not going anywhere, Keith. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll have the questions, and you know, you can get this. Hold the question. Hold the question. Yeah. Let me wrap it up. Okay. Wrap so it up. Spike Lee. Spike Lee. 
Spike Lee does this br brilliant movie and I got to meet Spike Lee and you know what he asked me? He said, if I was to do that movie again, what would you have me do different? Can you imagine that? Spike Lee asking, asking me a question like that. You know what I said? I said, Spike is brilliant. I said, you don't change anything. So what you did is a work of art. What I did is a work of documentary, right? Uh, brother, you don't, you don't fix a masterpiece. And that movie is a masterpiece. And Denzel was robbed of the Academy Award, a fact that Spike Lee acknowledged. So you watch that scene, you will see You'll watch the assassination as it happened. Malcolm walked to the rostrum. He gave the greeting. He said, "Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam." One and really two of the men in the back created a disturbance. Said, "Get your hand out my pocket!" Threw down a smoke bomb. Everyone turned around to see what was going on. At that moment, William X. Bradley got up from about the second row walked up to about 15 feet away from the rostrum, pulled out a sword off shotgun, he took aim and he blasted right through the rostrum and hit Malcolm right in the heart. Seven of those shotgun pellets, it formed a, it was about 12, 10 or 12 pellets around the heart, but seven of them ripped Malcolm's heart to shreds. He fell back, the blast was so powerful, his legs didn't even have time to buckle. He just fell back and his head hit the stage with a thump, bow. They said that if the shotgun blast hadn't killed him, the head, the way his head hit the stage would have killed him. And then two shooters jumped up from the front, one firing a 45, the other firing a Luga. The Luga was fired by Leon Davis, the other by Talmadge Hayer, and they started emptying their clips into Malcolm's supine body. And then, of course, we know that Hare was shot in the leg by Malcolm's security detail, Mr. Reuben Francis. Watch that scene, because Spike did a beautiful job recreating that scene. Uh, one of the things I noticed when I went to the municipal archives and studied the color photographs is just how dingy and dank and depressing the place the Autobahn was. It was, really was a dump. It did look like death. And Spike caught that, even to the white piano on the stage. So yeah, I cannot say a good, uh, enough good things about that. Most importantly for this discussion though, is that this is the 30th anniversary of that movie, 1992. And for 30 years, this is the point I wanna make here folks. For 30 years, the way the public, the general public has understood the assassination of Malcolm X is the way they see it in that movie. Five killers, five killers, as it was, and not three killers, as the government argued in the case. That's why these men were exonerated. The way we even think about it has to do with the way it was presented in the popular culture via this brilliant movie. Now, let's move ahead. I'm gonna wrap this up, wrap this up point here now, and then I'm gonna take your questions. Who killed Malcolm X? I come along in the early 80s. I see these interviews of Talmadge Hare, uh, and it bothers me, you know, I, in a very young, youthful, naive kind of way, the way many of you young people are. Okay, I think, you know, someone is going to rectify the situation, right? I mean, he, he, the man's saying, these men didn't do it. We got to get them out. Someone will get these men out of prison. No one did, no one did. Um, fast forward a little bit more, around 1986, I became a Muslim myself, um, but I was also very much an activist. And, and I've always loved scholarship and I see myself working in the tradition of the activist scholar, okay? And what I, through my research, was able to determine is who these men were. And I published for the first time in history, the name and the, ident the real identity of the shotgun assassin, William X. Bradley, who went on to be known as 
Al Mustafa Shabazz in 2010. This was featured in Manning Marable's book, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. And then this revived the case. Before that, there uh, was, the case was, let's say, dead. It was a dead letter. As you see in the documentary, one of the brothers says, Ur Sadiq, he says, the assassination of Malcolm X, it's in the history books. Leave it there. That's exactly where it was until we came along. And so with that, I'm going to conclude my talk, open it up for questions, and hopefully I will have something um, that will be edifying and informative. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Muhammad. We really appreciate it. Uh, our first question comes from a uh, student, Lexi. Hi, Mr. Muhammad. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, my so pleasure. My, thank you. <laughs> our first question for you is, what unanswered questions began your crusade to understand who killed Malcolm X? You know, one of the questions that I had was, how deep was the government involved in it? To what extent or what role they had, in, you know, was it? Um, you know, was it something like what happened with Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, where the federal government, FBI, uh, working with Chicago Police Department, actually orchestrated, you know, the assassination of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, where they recruited a undercover operative who, you know, created a map of, of, of the house where they lived and actually gave Fred Hampton, you know, so a drug to make sure he was sleeping when they raided the house and, and gunned him down. I mean, that is a smoking gun. You know, the, the, the Fred Hampton and Mark Clark's family sued the government. Uh, can you imagine our own government plotting an assassination against one of its own citizens? That's what happened in the case of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. I wanted to know how deeply involved our government was in the assassination of Malcolm X. I did not find that kind of smoking gun. And I'm not the only one who's looked at this. There's other folks as well, Peter Goldman, uh, David Garrow and others. Uh, but what we do find is that the government under the direction of J. Edgar Hoover and his FBI COINTELPRO was uh, playing dirty tricks by uh, planting stories in the media. They had agent provocateurs uh, in both organizations um, within the nation. And then when Malcolm breaks and Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam to create suspicion, uh, hatred, slander, and just basically, you know, uh, uh, the, the kind of propaganda that led up to the assassination. And I believe to that extent, they are definitely uh, involved and have a role, but the uh, the the um, you know in the final analysis, ultimately the responsibility rests with the killers who came from the Nation of Islam from Mosque Number Twenty Five in Newark, New Jersey, and that is the conclusion that I reached, and that is the question that I had. I did not find a smoking gun, but as you see in the series. Uh, the government did protect for whatever reason that we don't know yet and may never know. They did protect the shotgun assassin from prosecution. That's a question that I would like to know and don't think I will ever get the answer to, by the way. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Elias Jones. I'm a student here at ASU. Uh, I had another question for you. So do you think having individuals as a face of a movement like Malcolm X or Martin Luther King um, is still important today or is the current system of faceless group action just as useful? Well, I subscribe to that. I, I think that there's a reason why we don't have uh, the type of leadership that we had in the time of Malcolm and Dr. Martin Luther King and also, you know, 
you know, again, Roy Wilkins and Adam Clayton Powell, Whitney Young, and these types of leaders, A. Philip Randolph. Um, I, I think we're living in the social media age and um, the social, you, you, am I still with you? Yeah, we live in a social media age where uh, young folk are not communicating person to person. They communicate on their phones. There's not a lot of human engagement. You know what I'm saying? In order to, you know, in order to build up a leader, you, you have to engage people directly. People, you know, find it easy to express themselves online, sometimes, you know, very uh, forcefully, very stridently, uh, and passionately online, but you meet them in person and they're very timid, have nothing to say, right? Or quiet or whatever. I think that's the reason why you don't have the kind of leadership you had back in that day. I, I am doubtful that, that that type of leaderless movement can be effective. I, I'm very skeptical, skeptical of it. Um, and I shared that belief or that, um, that perspective at a recent university, I was at the University of Redlands uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I shared that perspective. Uh, I think that we have to get back to engaging one another and building up organizations and learning how, you know what I'm saying, to, look, let's put it like this. We're over, we're over there in, uh, okay, there's, there's a battle being, being fought in Europe right now, right? Putin uh, against the Ukraine, okay? The question is, if, if God forbid the United States had to get involved in that, do you want us to, would you want us to go over there, each soldier, a leader unto himself, or do you want to go over there with generals and leaders and hear it and obey and troops marching in rank and formation? That's, that's the question that I would ask. I'm skeptical of it, the leaderless model, and, uh, but, you know, I don't have all the answers, and I don't want to be judgmental of the young folk. It's your leadership. It's your it's your movement now. I'm just here to offer my perspective. That's the era I'm from. I'm from Malcolm's era, Dr. King's era. I believe in in that leadership model. But hey, back in those days, we didn't even have pages, much less uh, smartphones and PDFs and email and all the Twitter and TikTok and everything you guys have now. So. I don't know. Maybe I'm kind of ancient, but that's. I hope I've answered your question, my brother. Yes, you have. Thank you. I'm just You're going welcome. to 25 seconds. I'm between the two generations. Um, <laughs> yes, um, and I'm waiting for the uh, uh, chips implanted into our brains so we can communicate that way. Um, okay, so uh, um, our speaker. Um, Abdur Rahman Mohammed has generously offered to stick around for more Q and A. I know there are more, but I just wanted to take. 15 seconds to officially thank him and to let those who have other commitments uh, sign off. Um, so thank you. Um, applaud. I know we can't see and hear everybody, but I know we're all applauding. And in about 10 seconds, we will go to our next question. Thank you so much. All right. Take it away, questioner. Looks like nobody's leaving. I think you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of people sticking around here. Uh, okay, I have a question from the, we have several campuses who are hearing this. Here's a question from the downtown Phoenix campus. Uh, why do you think that black people today have a different opinion of Malcolm X compared to those of the 60s? What shifted in the culture so that people are now more supportive? You know, that, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's the reality now that um, we, under, we understand better the role that he played in the civil rights movement, even though he himself never claimed to be a civil rights leader. He didn't, in fact, he didn't like that term. He thought that civil rights was a domestic matter. As long as you uh, called yourself a civil rights leader, or were fighting for civil rights, then that was a domestic issue that could only be redressed by the very same government, the very same system that was oppressing you. And his, you know, his thought was, you know, um, 
you know, what government that's oppressing you is going to give you civil rights. They're the, they're the culprit, right? So he wanted to take it out of the realm of civil rights and put it in the international court, all right, United Nations. He wanted to take our case as a matter of human rights, all right? But back in those days, we didn't understand that um, the militancy of a Malcolm X, the militancy of his voice um, is what gave the civil rights leaders the leverage with the system to extract these gains, you know? And Malcolm even said, when he, you know, when he went down, he spoke to um, you know, Dr. King's wife in Selma, Alabama, the month of his assassination, early in that month, I believe it was February 4th. And, you know, he, he said, look, I support your husband, whatever they, what, if they don't want to go his way, right, then they have to deal with us. And I don't think they want to deal with us. And by the way, we know now that what Malcolm was saying really was not all that radical after he left the Nation of Islam. When he was in the nation, yes, it was a pessimistic, unrealistic ideology of separation that was never going to fly with most Black people. But when he left, he talked about our right to defend ourselves predicated on the Second Amendment, right? He said, that's a, that's, a, that's a right that we all have. And if the government is not able or willing to protect us, then we must defend ourselves by any means necessary. And that type of military, and by the way, that's the reason why the movement, you know, these young angry people, these, young, these youth of that period were moving more towards Malcolm even in the so-called conservative, respectable Negro organizations, NAACP, uh, SCLC, CORE, Urban League, they were becoming very militant and pro-Malcolm. And even after his assassination, you know, then, you know, we have the riots in Watts, in Newark, in Detroit, on and on and on, right? So he, he, he saw the militancy uh, where this was going, and this gave Dr. King leverage and the civil rights establishment leverage to get the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. These are huge victories. And so now with the passage of time, okay, we can see that what, number one, what Malcolm was saying wasn't all that radical, okay? And we can also see that his voice was needed right, to complement. That's why today we put them together. We say Malcolm and Mark, right? When in 1963, 88% of black people supported Dr. King and only 15% supported Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm. I hope I've answered your question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Here's one from the West Campus. Uh, what inspired your interest in exploring Malcolm X so much? And, you know, why were you on the, on the task? You had a day job, so you were working, you were working uh, in your spare time, whereas the prosecutors were asleep in Manhattan and in Newark, and the police were asleep, and the investigative journalists in New York City, they were asleep. So what made you so different from everybody else? Why did you, how did you get, so motivated to do this? You know, that, that's a good question. Um, it's a question I've asked myself many, many times and still ask myself. A lot of it has to do with the way I was raised. Um, my father instilled in us um, um, a deep commitment to doing the right thing. You know what I'm saying? He said, if you see something that's wrong, you should redress it, right? You should address it. Uh, a lot of it is my own makeup. You know, I, I'm very passionate. And um, I, because of my own, you know, abuse at the hands of the Providence Police Department in my hometown when I was a, a teenager, young kid, um, the righteous indignation, you know, and injustice and oppression. I hated it, actually. 
uh, it changed the trajectory of my life. I went to Howard University. You know, I was very, I was full of, I was full of, of, of anger and righteous uh, indignation at the way, you know, black people were treated. And so I, I, I wanted to move to a black city. DC was considered, you know, chocolate city at that time like 73% African American was a rich black culture. Uh, but this was this was a milieu of movement. You know, you had the anti apartheid move, anti apartheid movement that was um, you know very strong. You had the movement to make Dr. King's birthday a holiday. You had the all African people's revolutionary party. You had the Muslims, where's where I ultimately went. So um I think that when it became clear to me that uh, no one else was going to pursue this issue, you know, that I felt that I, I owed an obligation to Brother Malcolm for the impact that he's had on my life and the, you know, the millions and millions and millions of people the world over. I felt that it really was a disgrace that, um, that people who are paid salaries to do what I did just, just didn't do it. Uh, there were contributions. I don't want to act like, you know, I did it all. I did not. But I think in my case, it was more of a crusade for justice as much as it was a scholarly matter. I think with so many other folks, it was just a matter of, you know, scholarship and an academic, intellectual, detached type of thing. Whereas with me, it was a very personal thing that I was driven to ultimately um, resolve. Great, thank you so much for that answer. Our next uh, question comes from the Polytechnic campus. Um, do you think there will ever be a point where the work on this topic will be complete? No, um, but I think that uh, at this point, we know most of the story. I think we have a very clear picture of what happened. Malcolm said repeatedly that the Nation of Islam was trying to kill him, and they killed him. Um, the week before his assassination, on the morning of February 14th, 1965, the Nation of Islam firebombed his house uh, with his family. He almost incinerated his babies, which is barbaric, which is eternal shame on the Nation of Islam. And we know for a fact now that they did do it. Okay, We know who did it. The, the, the member who did it, I'm, I'm not gonna say his name. Um, so uh, there are people, there are many black people that get angry with me for not saying, you know, the government killed Malcolm, the feds killed Malcolm, FBI killed Malcolm. That's the nation of Islam's line today. That's not necessarily Louis Farrakhan's line, but that's the line that his ministers take, that they're, free and clear of it. They had nothing to do with it. No, in fact, they are the, you know, um, the, the key, uh, the most responsible agents in the assassination of Malcolm X. They are the ones most guilty, in, in my opinion. And the, the government and its, you know, undercover operatives were, you know, working in the background to create dissension and suspicion and create, you know, a, a, a climate of hatred against Malcolm, but it was actually carried out by members of the Nation of Islam. And I'm very clear about that. Do you want to say a word about uh, Muhammad Aziz, the man who was exonerated in November 2021 by the Manhattan prosecutor who's still alive and he was in the courtroom. There's an ABC documentary that featured you. Uh, about that. you want to say a word about him and his life and his family? You know what? I don't know. He's a very private man, and I try not to invade his privacy. Um, I can tell you that at the time, uh, he actually stood security for Malcolm X, excuse me, on December 
December 1st, 1963 at the Manhattan Center uh, when Malcolm gave the chickens coming home to roost speech. Uh, he was uh, an enforcer. He was in the FOI, as all the male um, members are, the Fruit of Islam paramilitary wing of the nation. But he was known to be an enforcer, just like um, Halil Islam, Thomas 15 X Johnson. And they were like the, the low hanging fruit, so to speak, for the prosecutors, for the, for the police, and then the prosecution. Um, and you know, it was made it easy for them to pick them up because they, you know, they they could be rough. They could be rough. They were known to be, um, you know, just just some really tough cats, so to speak. But I don't know him. I know him in the sense that I, you know, we talk. But to go into his family and all of like that, you know, I don't feel comfortable talking about. Him. But but he and the family were thrilled that he was exonerated. Is that right? Oh, more than thrilled. Um, <laughs> he was really more so happy for his family than for him because his position was nothing the system does, nothing the system took from me, them giving it back to me is not gonna make me happy because they had no right to take it from me in the first place. I'm happy for my children, you know what I mean? That they know their dad didn't do this, that this stigma doesn't get passed on to posterity, to the grandchildren and the great grandchildren. They don't have to live, you know what I mean? With that shame and that burden. So he was happier for his children than for him. He, yes, I'm sure, you know what I mean? Inside, he, he was, pleased that it happened because he did not believe that it would happen. You saw that in the series. And he said right. that, he said that, you know, hope is a dangerous thing. So he couldn't even allow himself to have hope that it would happen. Because if it hadn't happened, I mean, first of all, he already did the 20 years, so they can't give him those years back. And then in the subsequent 30 years or so, if they didn't make it right then, what makes you think they're going to make it right now? Right, so that's he, 20 years he, in prison. That's right. So he had resolved it within himself that he, he, he you know, there, he called them all liars. He said the system did, they're all liars. And um, so there had to be, a, there had to be a, a relief, a sigh of relief, you know, that it had happened. Any other questions? I'm here. Uh, she's got one more question. Uh, okay, one gotta, more question. We're gonna try to wrap this up though. There's one in chat too. Okay. If you could read the chat to me after the next question, that'd be fine. So the last question from the audience is, what good was served by prosecuting the two men when the third man said that they were not um, involved? Can you repeat that question, please? Yeah. So. What good was served by prosecuting the two men when the third man said they were not involved, in your opinion? Oh, in, in my opinion, I believe there was a lot of political pressure to close this case. Um, I believe that they prosecuted these two men uh, wrongfully because the federal government had, um, they had undercover agents or undercover informants, okay, in the ballroom that day. And two of those informants actually took the stand for the prosecution, okay? They took the stand for the prosecution even though they were FBI informants, and this was some of the new evidence that came out by Cyrus Vance, one of his uh, one of the things that he unearthed that the director J. Edgar Hoover had ordered these uh, informants to not reveal their identity either to the prosecution or the defense, which should have you know what I mean. 
Uh, and so I say that they they didn't want this COINTEL operation revealed. I think I think that they didn't pick up the real killers because to do so they would have had to you know they would have had to expose all these agents in this this uh, clandestine operation that the government. You got to remember, we we know about it now since because we had congressional hearings in the '70s and what have you, you know. But there, 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 there never was. There'll never be a time when someone could have as much power as Jagger Hoover. So I think what was served is the um, they they had to shut it down for political reasons. These two men were easy to pick up because of their their tough reputation in the nation, and it protected. Uh, the clandestine counterintelligence program of J. Edgar Hoover. That's what I think. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, I think we may be out of time. Okay. Is so there a text? I mean, I can keep going for, for give hours. Me, but... Give me the next question in the text and then. Okay. Uh, let, uh, you got the question in the chat? Melissa? It was sort of answered, but I don't. I, 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 Brandon, if I'm not clear, if I'm not clear, ask me to clarify. Well, Brandon, did you take that to question down? Uh, Brandon doesn't have it. Okay, who took it? Uh, uh, Brandon thinks it was answered. Okay, all right, we'll leave okay. it. Okay, all right, great. Right. Thank you. My pleasure. I have one more, and then this is the last one. Okay. Uh, do you agree with the sentiment at the end of the autobiography of Malcolm X that Malcolm X would be moving was moving toward a nonviolent stance? That's the one. That's the question. Thank you. <laughs> well, the truth Malcolm of the matter is toward a nonviolent stance. Well, Malcolm was Malcolm was nonviolent with those who were nonviolent with him. <laughs> <laughs> that was his position. It's not an issue of violence or nonviolence. You see, Malcolm's, Malcolm would have never, ever, ever taken armed self-defense off the table. And I believe, right. it's that, I believe it's that position that made it very difficult, that would have made it very difficult for him to work too closely with the civil rights movement, which was you know, nonviolent, passive resistance. Malcolm said, I will be nonviolent with those who are nonviolent with us. He said, but I'm not nonviolent with those who are violent with us. And he also said that you have to learn to speak the language of a man. He said, if a man speaks German, you can't speak to him in French. You got to speak to him in the language that he understands. He says, if the Klan and the White Citizens Council speaks to you in a certain kind of language, he said, that's the language you have to speak. In other words, he's talking about what you call violence, right? He said, you know, that's the language they speak, then that's the language we're gonna speak. But he never, um, he never, you know, talked about armed resistance or armed uh, revolution against the government or taking up arms against the government. He never advocated that. And in fact, he advocated against that. He taught against that. And the proof of that is, uh, pick up the book, Malcolm X Speaks. If you don't have it, it's online for free. There's a PDF in the ballot or the bullet speech of April 3rd, not April 12th, the one that you most often hear on YouTube. The speech, because he, he gave that speech twice. A lot of people don't know that. The first time he gave it in April 3rd, 1964, was at the Corey Methodist Church in Cleveland, sponsored by CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, and the Socialist Workers Party. In that speech, and it's in Malcolm X speech, uh, Malcolm X Speaks, it's online, edited by George Brightman. He says, you know, we're not, you know, in, in essence, you know, I'm not teaching you to take up arms against the government. That's illegal, he said, very clearly. In many interviews, he said that he was not for anarchy and he was not for going to war with the government, which many people misinterpret him later and actually did that. And you had black militant groups that did go to war with the police 
and you know, war with the government, whatever, Malcolm would not have co-signed that. Um, but in answer to your question, he never took armed self-defense off the table. And um, that's a very good question. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that you asked me that. Well, thank you. I think we have to uh, wrap up. We're run out of time and gone over time. We greatly appreciate uh, Melissa Free and Kendra Hassan and everybody involved in Brandon uh, for uh, facilitating this. And especially we appreciate uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman Muhammad, who, as I said, is one of the great researchers of our time. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. It's really been a really been a great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this hour and a half, but also for, as Keith says, years and years of research. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck with everything. Thank you.